All right, now if you'll go ahead and mute Gil, let's uh, let's go ahead and uh, and get going. Uh, first of all, thank you for attending and thank you for signing up. This is a demonstration of uh, how Gil Morales, uh, whom you all you all know, uh, uses uh, HGSI. He's been a customer for 12 years, I believe. He started in 2010, and uh, he tells me that this is his go-to program. Now, as we were discussing before the uh, webinar uh, started, uh, it HGSI can be complex if you let it become complex or if you use it like I use it, uh, unfortunately. But Gil has a much simpler method, and he's going to demonstrate what he does and uh, how he gets the most out of this program. So, uh, Gil, thank you for doing this with me. And uh, I'm sure that uh, everybody's going to appreciate uh, what you or what we discussed today. So go ahead. Yeah, basically, uh, first I want everyone to know that I'm actually a, an HSI customer. I pay for my software. Nobody, nobody pays me to take it and endorse it. I've tried a lot of programs over the years, including uh, Wanda, which is William O'Neill Direct Access. That was the institutional big brother or big sister, I should say, to Market Smith. So I was basically, I, I grew up using that sort of uh, interface and the screening modules and all the other stuff. And uh, I would say MarketSmith is not, it's its kind of like one of not really that close. And I, I've used other things like TC2000. I use stock charts today as well for other reasons. But when it comes to finding stock ideas in the market in real time, HGSI is my weapon of choice. And... My, over the years, my my approach has evolved to one that I, I think is actually similar to Bill O'Neill's uh, approach. Because back when I was working for him, between '97 to 2005, um, there were several times where I sat down with him, and he would be going through his chart books. We had these big database books that were, I forget, it's 11, 14 by 17, 11 by 17, something like that. But they're huge books, and they have uh, four charts on. Every time on, on each page, the facing page and the page you're on is a, a total of four charts, two on each side, big weekly charts. And basically what Bill would do, there would be two books and um, the top rated groups in the first book and the lower rated groups in the second book. But, you know, probably about a thousand charts in there. And he would just go through the whole book incredibly fast. And I watched him do this. One day he came in, into my office and he was huffing and puffing. And he's like, oh, I didn't get a chance to look at my stuff over the weekend. So he's like, give me your chart books. And. And so I did. And he takes them and he starts flipping through them like at lightning speed. And then when he sees something he likes, he rips the page out. And I'm sitting there, hey, you're tearing up my books, buddy. And, and uh, he's like, I oh, don't worry about it. Just go down to the print shop, get some more. But that's how he did it. He, he would look at as much as possible and then he would distill it down to about, you know, maybe 20 stocks he's watching on his screen every day. And that's basically what I do. So I want to see as much as possible as fast as possible. And what attracted me to HGSI when I first started using it, even though I admit it, it's a little bit intimidating, but I probably use it in the simplest way that you can, and I can use it very effectively. I think my members can attest to that, um, and ultimately they can be the judge. Uh, but, but you know, for example, let's go through what's going on in the market right now using my process, and I'll kind of walk you through what I do. Essentially what I like to do is build groups. And I build groups of stocks that can be based on industry. They can be based on uh, some sort of the thematic, which can be either a, an infinite PE theme or as the, the list here I have um, gives me groups, stands for Gill Stock Market Ideas, GSMI groups, uh, EV, electric vehicles. So this is a group I put together, but it's stocks that aren't, aren't just electric vehicle makers. It's also it's the charging companies. The battery companies, the lithium companies, and anybody else who might be related uh, to that business. And we can see right away um, that these names are moving today because, for a very simple reason, the Biden administration is going to be, I don't think it was, what, $250 billion bill uh, that, that's corporate welfare for the, uh, green the green energy industry. So all these things are gapping higher. And you could pick this up pretty quickly in the day. Uh, just by cycling through these groups. Because what I, was, what I will do is very quickly early in the day, within, say, the first 10, 15 minutes, I will cycle through all my groups, and I can quickly see which ones are performing within the group, which groups are performing. Some, some may not be doing anything. It will be mostly red in the percent change for the day columns, which 
which are the you have price change and the percent change here. So I can just run through, you know, miners were doing pretty well today. Uh, you see oil's kind of a mixed situation, half of them down, or a little less than half down. Um, you look at, say, retail. Retail was coming back today, but it was beaten up pretty good earlier in the week when uh, Walmart lowered guidance and pretty much highlighted how quickly things are slowing down for them. You can see semiconductors are rallying pretty well today. So essentially what I'm doing during the day is running through these groups very quickly. First, I'm doing it visually looking at these lists on the uh, <clears throat> the warehouse view, which is what this is called, HSI warehouse, and uh, I can get a quick sense of what's moving, what isn't moving, and uh, where things are. I can also look at things, for example, if I wanted to put a filter over this, let's say I want to see which stocks are pulling back on light volume. So I have a voodoo screen, and for those of you who know my work or are familiar with it, you know that a voodoo day is a pullback day where uh, volume dries up uh, in the extreme. So uh, for some stocks, 30, 35% below average, most stocks I want to see 40, 50, 60, the drier, the better. And, uh, and that's what this will pick up. So if I overlay, you'll see that there were none here in this group, but if I go through say some others, let's look at, uh, miners today, nothing there either. Uh Oh, maybe we'll get nothing. How about a bigger group? Here you go. Here's one. So you can see that was pulling back into price support with volume drying up, minus 51.3%. Not really a candidate, but it gives you an idea of how I can quickly break down what's happening in the market and also with the stocks that I'm following uh, myself specifically. So, you know, I can get through things pretty quickly. And that's, in my view, that's how you, how you find stocks. And it's based on the way I watched Bill and Neil do it originally when he would just plow through charts, piles of charts and, and find what interested him. And then from there, he would call it down even further. And so you can do that pretty easily with uh, HDSI. But but to d generate these groups, I'm watching, number one, I'm watching what themes are in the market that are relevant currently. So if it's electric vehicles at one time, if it's the SPACs at another time, solars might be in play at, at another time, semiconductors, which actually have been great short since January, you know, that's another group. And I actually have that divided into what I consider to be semiconductor uh, big stocks, which are the bigger names within the group. And then I have the broader one, semiconductors in general, which is a much broader group. But you can see today, semiconductor big stocks were doing pretty well uh, overall. And I mean, not huge performance, most of them 1% to 2%, maybe a little more. But uh, LAM Research was uh, leading. It reported earnings last night and what you can see here right away visually you see the highlighted blue area on the the volume bars tells me that the last two days were pocket pivots and you can see that lamb posted a pocket pivot yesterday at the 50 day line however i'm i'm pretty certain that the volume is skewed by the after hours volume once they reported earnings but today stock started down held support around the 10-day line and then turned and posted a pocket pivot so it looks like it may want to go higher from here. We'll see if it turns out to be a one-day wonder trade or not. But you see a lot of stocks doing that um, where they'll have one big up day. Often it comes at the end of a uh, – so let's go back to LRCX actually. <clears throat> so you can see this is coming at the end of a move up. You had a little consolidation over the past weeks. And it could – potentially move higher. But you also have Intel reporting after the bell. And uh, what happened there? Let's see. They're down. Oh, they're down trading 35.88 bid. They close at 39.71. What is that, Ron? 10%? Uh, more? Yeah. yeah. About that. Yeah. So that's down pretty good right now. Apple is up a little bit. Amazon's up about 10%. Roku is getting clobbered down at 62.90 bid after closing at 85.28, but that's a, an infinite PE stock, and it actually has been on my Ponzi stock list since the latter part of last year when I started building it. So once I feel a list is ready to go, I'll load it onto this uh, version of the software. I have it on uh, two other machines, and I use them for research. This is my trading uh, desktop here. So once I load things on here, this is where they finally get put into action, and I develop my list on my other machines and they remain proprietary in any case do you have as far your ponzi list on now do you have your ponzi you have list? My ponzi's in here yeah ponzi stocks uh 
I wonder if I have the I have the infinite PE list. So these are stocks that essentially have an infinite PE. Roku is one of them. We can see here that uh, Roku. I mean, this thing's already eighty something percent off the highs. If I back up very quickly, this is one thing I like about HSI is that I can back up and get a big uh, you know get the long ter longer term view. You can see it's actually a uh, double top. So right here, a double top breakout here that failed. And that's, that's a short sale entry. As I teach a double top short sale entry in, uh, in my reports and, my, and actually not in any books yet. The double top uh, formation has been a favorite short sale formation for me in this bear market uh, simply because it works. <laughs> and that's the other thing is when you're looking at a lot of stocks as fast as you can, you start to notice patterns that things are acting uh, similar or there's particular patterns or ways of, of acting that stocks show that lead to outcomes that in this case are more bearish than bullish. So, you know, after observing a lot of double tops as I'm going through all these charts, and this was several months ago, I began to adopt a double top uh, setup as a short sale setup. And the interesting thing is I don't talk about any of, of that, the double top setups in any of the books I've written on shorting, which are two of them. And then there was a chapter on it in the first book I wrote with Chris Catcher, how we made 18,000% in the stock market. So this is a new development. And this comes directly out of uh, the way I approach HESI and what I get out of it, because I can see so much of the market so quickly. And I just flip through charts, you know, like, uh, well, much like Bill O'Neill flipped through the books way back when. But, you know, basically I'm doing this. In real time, I'll go through my groups. Once I review things, if I see a group I want to go through, you can go through them very quickly. And I can look at, oh, there's one that looks interesting. That's Blink. That's an EV name. So, you know, looking at uh, Infinite P stocks, you can see that they have been rallying. And that makes sense. I think a lot of these are 80 90% off their highs, so they've been beaten down pretty good. And, uh, you know, they're, they'll, you'll, you'll get very sharp rallies in stocks during bear market rallies. And I think that's what we're looking at here. Um, so, you know, let me just talk about uh, what's going on in the market right now. And, and essentially, what well, you have had this week, a lot of a lot of earnings reports. So we're in the thick of earnings season. And today is the same thing as well. Uh, and and you, today you had GDP comes in. The first read on Q2 GDP is minus 0.9%. And what I find interesting about the way that the Biden administration, Janet Yellen in particular, was massaging it, she's trying to say, that, oh, well, the decline is due to a 2% decline in inventories. Well, yeah, but last year, the big increases in GDP, which the, you know, the Biden administration was quick to take credit for, were caused by hoarding and the building up of inventory. So now you're getting that whole process being reversed out and where it lands is anybody's guess but the, the bigger issue and this is something i find uh i guess i shouldn't be too surprised politicians and government officials are by nature devious and, and sinister in my view uh maybe not intentionally so but if you think about it inflation is 9.1 percent right that's what they tell you but they calculate inflation a lot more differently than they did back in 1980, which they like to compare today's number to. So they say, oh, it's 9.1%. It's the highest since 1980. But the, if we calculated inflation today the way we calculated it in 1980, it would actually be closer to 20%. So if GDP is adjusted for inflation using the GDP deflator, which is the government's uh, – you know, woefully uh, inadequate measure of inflation, I would say highly understated, extremely understated, then GDP may be a lot more negative than we think. So it seems like right now the market is operating on the basis of this idea that uh, the Fed just raised 75 bips and they'll raise another 50 and 25 and then that's it. You know, they get to three and a quarter, three and a half. How do you know? How does anybody know? How does the Fed know? They didn't even know what inflation was going to do last year. So the assumption that they know what they're doing and they're going to engineer a soft landing and they know they're going to go to three and a quarter, three and a half on the Fed funds target rate assumes that they're getting close to being done and then they're just going to start printing it again. But there, there are a lot of embedded assumptions in there. And if we do go into a deep recession, uh, that's going to impact money flows, credit flows, et cetera, and basically liquidity in general. And I don't see how that creates a backdrop or the underlying condition necessary to drive another bubble rally, to reflate the bubble, so to speak. So I think there are a lot of unknown unknowns and a lot of unintended consequences, you know, that 
could arise. And so you really do have to be ready for anything. And you, you do need to be using a system. And I, I would also say a method. I don't use Can Slim anymore because it's utterly irrelevant. If you look at uh, most of the biggest winners last year or b between 2020 and 2021, most of them had no earnings. So these Ponzi names that I've got here, and they've worked as a great shortlist since November of last year. Before that, they were my long Ponzi. <laughs> it's the same <laughs> list, okay? But they were going up at the time because I knew that there was this Ponzi phenomenon where you had retail investors getting all excited about companies that were going to build orbiting space platforms or companies that were going to build, uh, you know, electric vehicles. Another, you know, the, the 70th company to announce they're going to build electric vehicles. And they were able to drive them up. So I think that that may be what's going on right now. But that was a theme, okay? And, and it starts out as a long theme, and then it eventually shifts to a short theme. And you can see the whole thing just kind of roll over at the same time. They all correlated together. And uh, it was just a, a, a great way to, uh, to pick off all those shorts, you know? And, and my members know that we've been on top of most of these names uh, the whole way down. And a lot of them had just blown up uh, famously. So if we look at, you know, something like uh, Blink, Gil, why don't you bring the index up? Uh, the what? Just double click on the index. Oh, that's yeah. GSMI groups. And you, the yeah, whole, the I got it. Yeah, you can see where they topped. They topped out in uh, November. But even before that, they were showing some signs of, of wobbling. The index, uh, this is the other thing that you can do with HCSI very easily is, is it automatically creates an index of your group. So it gives you a picture of what it's doing. And then what you can do, and I like to do this on a daily basis, is uh, you can put it into a ranking module. So these are all my groups, and it immediately tells me what's, what's hot. And uh, so far this week in renewable energy project development, Toys and games. I think that was because Funko was on the move today. I, also, I saw Funko on a big flag breakout. The only problem with that is they report earnings next week. Um, and also renewable energy equipment, construction related. I think some of that would have been uh, clean energy infrastructure. Uh, and basically that's what was driving things today. So you had that. You also had the solars moving. I don't see them in here right off the well, bat. Well, uh, you're looking here at the week uh, on the ranking module. Gil. Right. So what do I want to do? Okay, well, th this ranking module, it starts from last Friday. So as right. a, as a week builds, it's you have to really go to the warehouse right. and, and, and look at the one day. Of, okay. Yeah. But you can see, I mean, I can see right away. Uh, also, if I rank them, you know, looking at groups in other ways, because I can do this, I think. Uh, you, can just, you can just click through to your warehouse view. And uh, and get an end of day view. And there's uh, that's where it's showing you right there. Well, you're still that's on an intraday. Oh, I yeah, you're right. You're correct. I'm sorry. No, I've got yeah, you got it. You, can you see got it. And games. I think that was Funko. So let's see if it'll come up here. No. Yeah, there's a big flag breakout, but I'm not going to chase that, especially with earnings coming up next week. But uh, so that was hot. You know, they had, this group was pretty hot, uh, renewable energy equipment. But I can just go to my solar group over here. And there's some interesting things going on here today, I thought. Uh, Enphase is just up there. You notice how it comes out of this choppy uh, low base. And the, the move up takes it all the way up to this high. And interestingly, today... And think back to the double top I just showed you in Roku, right, when it topped out. Uh, your, your high here on the left side is uh, 282.46, okay? Today you reached a high of 285, and then you reverse, and you close at 274.18. So basically, as it came back through this left side peak, and this is a basic double top setup, uh, it's a short, and then you use this left side peak as your covering guide. It may not work. It may continue going higher, and then maybe at a later point it comes back and pierces this left side peak. But right now that's in play as a possible uh, double top short sale setup, and that's how I will play it. So with all of these moving on news, I usually do get perked up when I see a group moving on news. In this case, it's the uh, the Biden says along with jo Joe Manchin uh, agreeing to uh, – put through a, a big 250 something billion dollar spending bill for clean energy which as anybody knows 
most clean energy is really not that clean, but that's another issue. Well, but in any case, Enphase, I can look at this group excuse quickly. Me. Enphase did report really good earnings. Yeah, that was uh, yes, uh, yes, day before uh, yesterday. Yeah, and that started the move. But now today the move gets driven further through this peak. And so it triggered a short sale entry. And if you played it, you picked off a few points. But, you know, the key here is to get in right here and see where this goes. We'll see how it plays out. Um, but you can see, you know, uh, Solar Edge, same, same thing, except it fell short of this high. But it's now starting to waver at this middle peak here. And that, that becomes a short also because it's basically a big uh, double top. And essentially that's the, the setup there. Um, some of these others, you see Sunrun pushed into the 200-day line. So I see that, and I'm more interested probably in shorting them than going long. SunPower, if you look at this closely, you can see that you're coming up to a double top peak here, and you also have the 200-day line. So this could be moving into a short sale zone. The only problem with most of these solars is that they are going to report uh, next week. So if I sort my list over here by earnings due, and I'm going to go back to an intraday. Whoops. Uh, I can just sort them that way. So I can see Solar Edge 8.2. That's going to be next Tuesday along with SunPower. Um, DQ is a uh, is going to get DQ'd, I think, by uh, delisting, but I'm not sure about that. But in any case, Run is on Wednesday. Array is another one. That's the week after. So, you know, th this is a quick way to check because the last thing you want to do is short a stock on the day that they're going to report earnings after the close, and it doesn't go your way. I don't really care to play earnings roulette. But, you know, <clears throat> getting back to the whole economic thing now, now Yellen also was saying that they can't call a recession because we're at full, un, full employment but employment is a lagging indicator so I don't really think that that's necessarily a clear indicator that we're not in a recession or that we aren't going into one I think you have to watch employment going uh, forward and the mean, meanwhile over the past month and this is what I found curious about this market is that you've had, if you look at the AAII, American Association of Individual Investors, you look at their bullish and bearish percentages. The bearish uh, side of the equation has been sitting up at extremes, and, and extremes we haven't seen since uh, 2008, I believe. And uh, it, it's been sitting there for a while, and it, and it made several peaks up there. It's starting to come back down a little bit. But it sat up there all that time. We've also seen a National Association of Active Investment Managers, NAAIM, uh, exposure survey shows that they got down to a net long exposure of 19% about a month ago. They're now moving that back towards the middle of the boat. So they're around 47.5%, I think, as of yesterday's or today's reading. Uh, they, they revise it every Thursday. But it's interesting that we've had uh, such bearish sentiment since – down here and yet you you don't see the market doing this uh when things got really morose back in march april of 2020 that's when we bottomed and turned very hard in here but of course we had the benefit of qe so there's a definite qualitative difference here that i think needs to be taken into account and that would be that in 2020 what drove the sudden uh rebound and, and as you came down and then you you just drove right out of there um, and you were pretty steady coming up, and you got up and, and off the lows pretty quick, uh, was the fact that you had this influx of uh, about $7, 8000000000000 trillion in monetary and fiscal stimulus. Today, we don't have that. And so I, my theory here is that there is a deficiency in buying power because you've seen an evaporation of buying power uh, from the, the basic uh, uh, the breakdowns in SPACs and uh, infinite PE stocks and electric vehicle stocks and all these hotshot names that have blown apart, you know, beyond meat, uh, Coinbase, the whole crypto space is also an area where, where over $2 trillion worth of wealth has essentially evaporated, it's disappeared. And I don't know if that money's out there ready to come in. So everybody talks about all this money on the sidelines, but it's not clear to me that it's ready necessarily to come in. And it's been very timid about doing so because if you look at this, you know, it's a very choppy trend to the upside. But we're heading, at least on the S&P, we're heading back to the May-June highs, and we'll see whether we can clear that. But meanwhile, all I can see here is that we are in something of a, a bear flag type position. Also, if I want to back it away... Um, you're, but you're still in this downward trend channel. So I, I see a downward trend channel, and you're moving to the highs of it. Now, you're going to have to show me a little more uh, upside thrust here uh, and probably a few more setups that that are 
forming in the upper parts of bases rather than coming off off the lows because it's just about every stock you look at is a bear flag so you know hey, you can hey, see that get, stuff like first solar is coming off a bear flag yeah ron could you uh explain your philosophy about looking at individual stocks to uh get a feel for the market rather than relying on the indexes well yeah i mean i think the indexes are very misleading these days and even on a day like today there were short sale opportunities out there even when the market's up and yesterday there were some as well uh early in the day so there are plenty of swing trades that you can pull off uh i, I think it's a lot harder than simply identifying an intermediate trend and then trying to play that you know you using the typical position building techniques but uh, that's just the nature of of what happens when you get into a position in a bear market where um you've been down for a while it's become very obvious everybody's bearish and uh, you're in position to to rally for a little while so if you look at say um uh, and this is another thing i like about hsi very quickly i can go back and look at uh, 2007 and uh 2008. So this is the market peak. It looks a little bit different uh, versus the NASDAQ. This is a peak in the market. You broke down very hard. And then it, the SPY rallied all the way back, the S&P 500. And as that occurred, you saw stocks turn around and do the same thing. Now, if we look at um, the Qs, for example, and we go back to 2008. See, none of this uh, having to enter in... Um, dates and all this other baloney you just come, come right in and just scroll back to what you want to look at so here's the peak in the nasdaq much worse and then it broke down and then we had this we had what i call it a double hump type of bear market rally so basically you had one rally that occurred from spring into early summer and then mid-summer you had another one that occurred here and then the whole thing blew up so we'll see whether we have another leg coming on the downside i tend to think that we do but, you know, we'll see it when it happens. But one thing you'll note here is that they, bear markets can last for a while, and they may not really get anywhere in the grander scheme of things, but if you're trying to short them, they will drive you nuts, and they will nick you to death or, you know, just death by a thousand cuts, I suppose. So, you know, a, a couple other things that I find useful here. Um, let's see if I can bring it up. Yeah, here's my, uh, this is my comparison chart. So I'm going to compare the QQQ. Well, no, what am I comparing this to? The NASDAQ to First Solar. And let's see if I can get this. So the, the blue line is the NASDAQ, and we're going to go back to um, 2007, 2008. So here we are. Boom, there we go. And you can see the, uh, here's the market top. First Solar actually topped before, um, I'm sorry, the market topped here. First solar is the blue one. So the black line is the NASDAQ composite. And you can see it had already topped ahead of uh, the market. And then when the market broke down, it broke down. And then when we went into a bear market rally, it did the same thing. And then it came back all the way around. And you'll notice that it actually broke out uh, in the middle of the bear market rally. So as the NASDAQ is in a bear market rally, the double hump bear market rally, this guy turns around and breaks out to new highs. That was a punch bowl formation that eventually played out as a punch bowl of death. But those are the types of moves that you can see during a bear market rally. I can go all the way back to 2000, and I'll show you a, a pattern. This is a stock that I played back then. It had a huge move uh, in 99, through 99 to March 2000, massive move. And then it topped, and it broke down uh, more than 50%. And then it rallied during the, the we had a, a bull market that started, or not a bull market, but rather a bear market rally, I should say. Bill O'Neill said it was a new bull market, but it was a bear market rally that started in June of 2000. And it carried on until August, September, and then everything blew up. But this is where I first started observing these punch bowl of death type formations. I actually was able to play this. So you got the first move here, and then it blows up. Didn't play that short, but then I played this long. And my mistake here was in not understanding that this was a, a punch bowl of death short sale setup, basically a corollary to a double top, right? Because you have two peaks here and here. And so I, I thought it was going to break out and we're going to have a glorious move to the high. So I'm, you know, I'm loading the boat in here and then it starts to break and kick me around a little bit. And I was slow getting out because I had such a nice cushion from the bottom. Um, but, you know, that shows you what you could see. The, the thing is we're not really seeing it. 
uh, yet. I think if you look at something, let's get rid of this guy. If you look at something like uh, Enphase, for example, that is essentially a, uh, a big punch bowl type formation. Now, the problem here is that you have a sharp break, but you have many, many months of uh, chopping around and consolidating, but you are in a double top position now. And yes, this has corrected more than 50% and it's coming all the way back. So uh, yeah, there is one there for you, but you know, most of the move occurs over the last two days, um, at least the fast part of the move, because everything else is just very choppy and very difficult mm -hmm. to deal with. And that's kind of the nature of this market. So anyways, um, what else, Ron? So other things. Okay. okay. So how do I I've got a question here, Gil, uh, from yeah. Austin. Gil, if you get a chance, can you cover the short scalp shuffle? I couldn't find anything on it in Twitter or Well, Gilmore. I mean, that's, that's simply, you know, taking day trades or uh, one or two day trades where you, you scalp things very quickly. Because as, as I just said, the market is very volatile. And even today, you know, we, it looked like every, you, you could have shorted the move up this morning and then uh, everything reversed really hard and you could have made some pretty decent money shorting stocks because I know something like LRCX was down pretty good. Uh, and also uh, Meta Platforms was down, which is the old Facebook. And all you're doing there is, you know, shorting it in the morning. If you get a break, you cover and you back away. But I, I do all that using my 5 minute 620 chart, which is not something I use uh, HSI for. I need real-time 5-minute charts for that. And for those of you who are familiar with my work uh, know what that's all about. So you go to Gilmore Report and uh, learn all about it there. But in any case... Yeah, that's basically all it is. Gil, is you, you've got, you've got, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt you. Somebody wants you to show LTHM. Uh, LTHM. Oh, yeah, is that Living it? Corp? Yeah, that, that looks like a short. Yeah, that was in, uh, in my EV list. I actually didn't finish going through it. We can do that, though, because this is what was moving. But, you know, in a, in a market like this, when things are moving to the upside, a lot of times... They're opportunistic short. So you can see this is, was actually short at the 200-day line. So that would have been good for at least the scalp today. I don't know where it goes tomorrow. Um, Albemarle moving higher. But, you know, most of these, they ju they're just pushing up off of the lows of bear flags. There's really nothing here. Plug power going a little bit further than the rest, but we'll see how this one plays out. Blink, same thing. But you can see every time you get a sharp move to the upside, need a bigger pen. There we go. You get these sharp moves to the upside, you get the big volume, and that's usually where they peak. So now you got another one, you got big volume on news, and maybe, you know, that's that exhausts all the buying power right there. So we'll see how these play out. But some of these names I'm looking at as potential shorts, and some actually were today, because if you saw Sunrun, for example, which is in the solars, okay, that this morning rallied up into the 200-day line, and then it was a short there. It came back down pretty hard, and uh, you had a cover point on the five minute 620 chart, uh, which I don't show here. Uh, and that was a cover point. So you basically were able to scalp it for like two, three bucks, which is about 10%. And that's basically what you're getting in this market because it's a swing traders market. You know, if you got, if you have a situation where the market is just chopping around the way this, this guy is, and again, you know, boom, 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 just back and forth, just very choppy. You can look bearish for a couple of days and then bullish and bearish right now. It looks a little more uh, bullish, but you're going to notice we had lighter volume on the queues today on the move up. I see Apple's up after hours along with Amazon. We'll just see how that plays out tomorrow. But for all you know, you're just going to run into the highs here and then back down again and stay within this bear flag formation. So, you know, Gil, uh, take, yeah, we take a look at SIGA, please. Oh, Sega? Yeah. That was the one we were talking about earlier. Well, this one is a uh, monkeypox stock. I, again, you know, this is just a hot, hot shot thing monkeypox is it's not that big of an issue you know really uh we've looked into it but yet it drives the stock higher because uh people jump in retail crowd sees it they all jump in by by calls and drive it higher but it's not something i really would want to mess with because you can see even after monkeypox started it started to get going but you get these big price breaks you had the initial run up here and then you get a breakdown you know that's 40 percent I'm, I'm not really interested 
in getting involved with stocks that are going to move that much in a matter of two days. So, the, you know, I don't know what I'm supposed to say about this other than that it's way extended. Well, yeah, sure so somebody asked down. if it was a short. Well, there's no reference for shorting it, so I wouldn't short it. You don't short stocks just because they're sticking up in the air. Now, let's say if this was some kind of a big double top, so it had a left side, you know, and it's running up towards the left side peak, it's possible you could find a reference point, which would be the left side peak, uh, price level, you could you could uh, use that as a reference level for a double top short sale setup, but the, you don't have that here. It's just sticking straight up in the air, and who now knows how far this goes? You get enough retail investors piling behind this buying calls, and they can drive it a while for a while. But once all that call buying stops, they can evaporate very quickly. And I think you saw that with a lot of names uh, last year. Uh, in in the Ponzi stock space, the SPACs, all of that stuff being driven straight up by massive call buying from the retail crowd. And then once they finish buying their calls, poof, that's it. So very tough stuff to get involved with uh, either way because they can continue to drive it if there isn't any inherent, uh, shall we say, organic overhead supply coming from the left side of the pattern. In this case, this thing's out in the clear. So I'm just looking through my notes. Uh, you know, the, the way I generate my list is really pretty simple. I look at all securities. And I have my basic filters. So they are uh, price up, minimum volu volume, erg over 150. And we had 124 securities that fit that criterion today. Uh, and so I can go through these charts and see what was up on volume. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean they're going to be buy candidates, but they might be candidates where I'm seeing some interesting technical action. And if I look into the company, I might even be able to discern some interesting thematic action. And then I can add it to one of my lists or my leaders list if I want to. Another thing that's very interesting right now, just as a quick aside, is that I maintain a leaders list in all markets and uh, bull or bear. And usually when we get to the top of a bull market, I've got 200 names on my leaders list. When we get to the bottom, I'll have 20 or 30. Right now I have 17. And we still haven't gotten this massive upside rally. Does that mean that's what we're going to have? I don't know. I think that underlying conditions are just so uniquely bizarre, paradoxical, and just downright twisted that it's hard to figure out, you know, where the buying power comes. How do you get back to where we were last year? I just don't think it happens. Um, let's see what else. Well, yeah, I'm getting. Uh, oh, I'm, oh, oh, some other things. So that those are, you know, the, I'll go through all these screens. Pr just regular price up on volume, no, no erg requirement. Price up on huge volume, price down with the erg over 150, uh, and those are basically leading stocks starting to break down. Price down on volume, okay. Voodoo, that's that's an overlay. So basic basic screens, okay. So I can go through this every day, and I generate names for my lists, and I populate my lists, and then I review my lists, like I was saying, in real time, going through them as fast as I can, because that's what HGSI allows me to do. Go through things extremely quickly, and because it's linked to uh, Thinkorswim, probably the only reason I have an account there. Uh, is to get the data in there, and then it's it's updating in real time. So, you know, uh, it's hard to find other systems that do that, um, and so conveniently, because all you do is link it to a trading platform you already have, which is also free in any case. Um, some other list that I look at, and this is how I generate my ideas. Uh, if you go to smart groups, and these two brilliant guys, Ian Woodward and Ron Brown, Ian is now trading up in trader heaven, he passed away a few years ago. An incredible market mind. I'm sure you, those of you who are familiar with Ron's work know about Ian. They were partners for many years. And Ron himself. Um, Rock and Ronnie. In any case, I like, there are a number of lists. So, you know, I know a lot of people like to build screens and everybody thinks there's some magic screen that you can build. Well, I got to tell you, there really isn't. My objective, and, and you've seen that over the last few years, because a lot of stocks that had huge moves, they have some very simple thematic drivers, but they don't necessarily have five quarters of earnings up, you know, and, and they're not even better if they have 10 because they don't even have uh, 10 negative quarters because they haven't even been around that long. So, you know, the, the whole can sl slim thing falls on its face in a market like we have today that's driven more by money flows and QE and liquidity than anything else. So I think just trying to look through pools of stocks and, and different criterion and these these guys put together all these great lists. One of my favorites is stocks and groups moving to the upside. Let's take the filter off. This is 100 stocks that comes out every every day. 
Um, and they don't necessarily have to be in extended positions up on big volume. So I'll pull names out of that. You can, you can go to um, the other lists that they have, um, the box stocks. And, you know, if you are into can slim type stuff, you know, they can em emulate the 85, 85, so 85 EPS, 85 RS. You can go through these names. There's only 63 that fit that criteria right now. But you can go through these names, and also I'll find names that I want to add to my list. And that's basically what I'm doing. It's a, I get a lot of questions, you know, oh, how do you screen for stocks, and how do you screen for this, how do you screen for that, what's the best way to screen, blah, blah, blah. It's like the best way to see what's going on with the whole market is to look at what's going on with the whole market, and this is how I do it. Um, I also have a pretty well-developed chart. I'm doing this for, what, 33 years now. So I can pick out what I want very quickly or what I'm looking for very quickly. And on HDSI, uh, Ron, Ron Brown, had, I think, is, uh, you know, is, has a certain kind of genius. Don't get a big head, Ron. But he's able to take – I can tell him what I'm seeing on a chart, and he can actually take it. So if you don't have 33 years' experience looking at charts and you don't intuitively see things – on the charts, he'll take what uh, I'm looking at and he'll create um, something like this with various indicators showing you where you have low volume pullbacks, tests for supply, all the VPA stuff, volume price analysis, um, areas, bars that indicate uh, subtle accumulation, etc. So if I tell him, okay, this is what I see on my daily chart, which is essentially this one, um, intraday right here. Okay, what I see on that, there's not much there. I got the pocket pivot indicator, but he can take what I'm telling him I see on this chart and then turn it into this, which has a bunch of indicators. If you want to look at that uh, and study it and learn what all the indicators are, then you can get a sense of what I'm seeing just intuitively if, if you don't have a lot of experience in looking at charts. So this is another way I find it useful in that uh, at least for people who uh, maybe want to try and see what I see on a chart, but aren't, don't have the skills yet or are still developing them. This can help you. Uh, and Ron is able to take what I see, and then he gives it a little bit of his own spin on top of it, which makes it even more unique. And then we offer it out as a, uh, a module of uh, filters and uh, warehouse views and chart views uh, on the system. Uh, that people can add on their own. So any other questions, Ron? Oh, there's been a bunch of questions. What uh, What are your little friends, Gil, and how do you use them pre-market and during the market? SQ well, I, I use them. My little friends are inverse ETFs, and I basically uh, use them when I'm looking for potential inflection points uh, in the indexes. So I, I don't have five-minute charts up here, so I can't really show you what I do there, but, you know, you can find all about it uh, on Gilmore Report, which is where I discuss it regularly in my video reports there, which I, I do two to three of those a week. Uh, basically doing what I'm doing here, going through what I'm seeing in the market at the time, we just go through some ideas, and I can also show my uh, intraday charts, but I don't have them here on this particular screen. So, And uh, out of deference, to my friends at HGSI, I'm not going to show any other systems on this chart. But, you know, I, I basically use them to probe for inflection points, and I use a 5-minute 620 chart to time entries. Um, I think I've showed the chart sometimes on my Twitter page. But I, I go into big uh, heavy-duty detail. I think you can even go into the education page on the Gilmore Report, and there might be a definition of it, but I don't think there is a publicly available uh, video or anything like that. So in any case, um, but that's basically what, what I use those for. And they come in useful. And also, uh, because this market tends to correlate, so for example, you will see that um, if I go back to my groups, let's kind of compress all this, like semiconductors, for example. If you look at semiconductors, these guys, they correlate like nobody's business. You know, they're all moving together more or less in a similar type of pattern. Um, so if you look at these, you know, I'll just scroll through these and you're going to notice a lot of these have similar looks to the patterns, right? So they tend to move together. And you'll find that's also the case with the airlines, with the financials, oil stocks, coal stocks, um, industrial metals. So what you can do is use an alternate strategy. Uh, rather than taking on individual stock risk, you can just use a uh, an ETF. So you know, everything, they're all based on the SMH, so you have, and you'll see that looks like all of these semiconductor names. So you can use the SOX S on the short side, the SOX L on the long side, and uh, 
today that would have worked and noticing that uh, it is trying to turn but we'll see whether this turn actually plays out into anything but you know you can take that approach with uh, semiconductors if we look at financials so I keep a list of uh, a very exclusive list of uh, financials here and uh, you can see the, these all look similar as well and they tend to move together well we have an outlier today US Bank Corp getting clobbered uh, but for the most part, you can see they all look exactly alike. You do have some outliers. I know Schwab moving. What, what happened? Did uh, U.S. Bank surrender to Schwab or something? Because they're moving in big, uh, big moves in opposite directions. In any case, what you can do here, instead of playing the financials, you can work the XLF. You could short that, or you could get the juice by using my little friends, the Financial Bull 3X Direction. Uh, ETF on the, the uh, long side and the FAS, FAZ, uh, on the short side. So not really working right now, but, uh, you know, you use the one that's appropriate and it's based on the idea that most groups in this market tend to correlate and move together. So, um, you know, like oil stocks, for example, and, and coals were all moving together. So you could play the XLE and you go look up leveraged uh, ETFs. I think there's like Gush is one of them. Yeah. And I forget what the other one is. Uh, drill? No. Uh, in any case, uh, what about, let's see, XME. Hey, Gil, I've got a question, and I don't have an answer at all. We XLE for metals and mining. XLE is energy. Um, go ahead. Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, would be nice to get an explanation on wild card theory that Gil has been using a lot. Well, the wild card theory, actually, I, I'm not using it a lot. It's just a theory, and it's basically why the market's moving now, because the market views uh, the, the Fed as being close to, to being done. And so also the economy is starting to contract very rapidly. And the theory is that the economy is going to uh, contract so rapidly and so uh, severely that the Fed is going to have to reverse policy sooner than later. So what that does is, is it drives stocks back to the upside on the expectation that they will be reliquifying the system. And that's basically what that is. Okay. Um, but, you know, there, there, I think there are a lot of uh, moving parts of that theory, and it may not play out. I mean, one of the things I would look for is a bottom and a turn in the precious metals. And, and over the past two days, we've seen uh, two five-day pocket pivots in the GLD. And the SLV uh, today posted a – yesterday you had a pocket pivot off the 10-day line and then today one that gapped through the 20 day line so it's trying to turn we'll see if it does the other thing is if you i'm going to reference the gld if you look at uh the lows here so if we take i believe this low and this low so the low here is uh 16068 the low here is 16097 you undercut both of those lows uh last week and now this week you've, you've rallied back above them uh, for the second time, this one is sticking a little bit better. So that is actually a long entry point. So we're actually buying this uh, a couple days ago as it's coming up through these lows on the left side. And you'll notice that if we back away, um, you know, those are the lows from uh, August. And uh, I think I got the right ones. Let me back away one more time. No, I'm sorry. Those are the lows from uh, May. And you know, both lows from May of uh, 2021. So you've undercut those and you're rallying back above them. And also these two lows here. So, you know, this, this could be turning. And if, if it is, then that would be one component of my wildcard theory coming to fruition because we really don't know how fast the economy is going to implode. But the other thing you have to keep in mind is that I don't think I've ever seen a time when we are moving rapidly into recession and the Fed is raising rates as aggressively as they are, but then they are well behind the curve. Because if you figure back in early 1980s, Volcker was raising rates above 20%, 20%, 20%, uh, to combat inflation at that time that measured out as the same as what we're seeing now, but yet was probably a lot lighter than we're seeing now. It's not clear that all of this is going to fall into place for the Fed, whether they can achieve a soft landing or not. I'm, I'm very doubtful, skeptical of. So I think you're going to get a hard landing. But if you get a hard landing, 
they could put him in an unusual position of having to suddenly start easing again, even as we continue to have relatively high inflation. And then, you know, then you've got all sorts of paradoxical forces at play that create, you know, unintended consequences. And you could have just, you know, weird uh, outcomes that you really haven't even thought of right now. So, you know, all that is to say this is a very complicated market right now. And I don't really see it as one for trend followers to be playing. Like I said, if you're a swing trader, if you can figure some of this out at this stage, you know, you can trade some of the volatility because I think for now the short side, well, it's it's pretty much uh, well established at this point that the short side ended in May. So back in here and then you're just chopping around kind of like, you know, you had an end point here and then you just chopped around, but then it came back into play very quickly. So the question for me now is uh, when does this come back into play again? So if I move my chart over so I can draw off into the right side, I mean, do we do we chop around like this and then break lower or are we going to head back to the highs, test this high and then break lower or are we just going to go higher in a hyperinflationary rally? There are a lot of potential scenarios and I don't think you can tell right now uh, really what's going on because there's so much that's unresolved. We don't know whether the Fed has in fact slain the inflation dragon. We don't know exactly how bad of a recession we're going into or economic slowdown we're going into or for how long. Uh, we know a lot of other things about how weak the consumer is and how they're starting to use credit to get by. And we'll just have to see how all those play out. But, you know, you don't have to be in the market all the time. If you want to swing trade it, yeah, there's some volatility. And I teach some mes methods for that. But in terms of uh, making big money, my experience is that when you can get an intermediate trend of at least a few months, that's where you're going to make your biggest and easiest money. And frankly, you know, do you really want to work that hard? <laughs> it's fun sometimes. And I keep a, a day trading account just for that purpose. So I don't screw up all my other accounts, but, uh, you know, it keeps me entertained. Uh, and, uh, Hey Gil, we're, we're, uh, you've talked for 53 minutes already. Holy cow. Uh, so, uh, I, I think I pretty much covered everything I wanted to well, go into. You've covered it. You've covered questions? covered a lot, and uh, I just I want people to to realize. Uh, you know, I get questions like, uh, "Do you think the market's going to turn?" and so on. Obviously, nobody knows. You base well, all of your analysis um, upon the charts. The market has turned. No, no but the I, turn has lasted about a month, but you don't know where it's going from here. Right. So. Right. Yeah, I mean, I think these questions that ask you to make predictions don't really understand how the market works. And my feeling is if we are starting a, a glorious new bull market, there's still plenty of time to jump on board uh, yeah. if, if indeed it uh, has legs to it. So I don't see any rush to do anything, especially since we're moving into August and um, typically a slow period. But, you know, the, if you recall, I think it was August of 2015, was it? Um, when I was in Hawaii in August um, and the market just blew apart and we had that flash crash at the end of August, if you remember that. I think it was a 2015. I don't remember. Yeah, yeah I remember. Uh, yeah, let's go back there real quick. See, and then one, one thing I love about HGSI is you just, uh, you want to go look at what a chart looks like, you know, 15, 20 years ago. It's just right in your face. There's no uh, screwing around. That, but that's let's nice. see, this would have been, um, yeah, there it is right there. You can see it. So this was the flash crash. You know, so August is like, oh, it's the summer doldrums, blah, blah, blah. And then all of a sudden, you know, screaming leap off the cliff there. And maybe that's what you see this time around. I don't know. And that uh, dark line, for the those of you who don't know, that's an oversold indicator. Which dark on line? The, on the chart. Right there. See, at the bottom. Right at the bottom. To the right. Right there? No. Okay. The, the, in the background, this? Gil. This? No, the other chart. This one. Right at the very okay. bottom. See that? Oh, 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 the, the bingo bar. The bingo bar. It's an oversold yeah, indicator. Yeah, that is an oversold indicator. So, you know, that tells you uh, that these are helpful, actually. When I'm looking at stocks, usually if I see three distinct clusters of these as a stock is making lower lows, usually the third one that you probably put in three waves to the downside and you're, you may be ready to turn. And th with indexes, they can often tell you when it's just oversold and do for a bounce, but you can't necessarily time it because you can see the bar starts showing up here, but you still had a ways to go to the downside, but it does give you a rough idea of when you're getting oversold 
uh, in the indices. Right. And, and that's a pretty good indicator, actually, one of my favorites. And it is, that's why it's on my custom chart view. So on HSI, you can get these chart views and uh, you can, I tweak mine a little bit uh, to make them the way I want them. But, you know, you can, you can do that with any chart view. So even the canned ones, like the ones that uh, are mine, the Gil Morales ones, uh, you can mess with and make them your own. So I think, you know, my, I think you can see, it's pretty clear that my approach is very simple. I, I probably don't use more than 5% of what the system can do. And a lot of people, they take this or they start using it, they become intimidated by what it can do. And I would say focus more on what you want to do and how it can work for you. And I'm always, I know what I want to do. Okay. And using this, and working with Ron, I'm always finding little things here and there that I can add to my process and that make this more value added for me, for my process. And I think that's really what anybody is trying to do. Um, I find MarketSmith to be very limiting. Um, also TC2000. And I just sort of gravitated to this because it's very visual. Uh, you have a lot of color contrast. Everything's got colors in it. And uh, I like that. So, so that's why I use it. And I pay for it. Yes, you do. So, oh, another thing I would point out, uh, we're in earnings season. And I think I might have posted this somewhere, or maybe one of my partners posted it on his Twitter page and it ended up on my Twitter page. But as you progress into a bear market, now we're about seven months into the 2022 bear market. As you're coming down, analysts are lowering their earnings expectations. So what happens is companies don't have to do that great to to beat those lowered estimates. So, you know, it's not as bad as expected. We've seen that with Google. I think Microsoft was the same thing. Uh, Amazon, probably the same thing as well, even though they reported a loss again. Um, Apple looks like the same thing, but the moves aren't really that great. Uh, in my view, they're typical post earnings moves. So they may offer short sale opportunities um, tomorrow. You know, today I noticed, uh, for example, we had v Visa reported uh, yesterday. And that worked out as a short, but you can see it's flopping around the 200-day line. It may break down from here. I think that's going to depend on what the market does. But right now, if it's closing below the 200-day line, I'm looking at that as a possible short entry. Uh, MasterCard uh, reported earnings this morning, and they posted a pocket pivot pushing through the 200-day line. So you could treat that as a long entry if you wanted to. Use the 200-day line as your selling guide. And I don't use, you know, 7 8% stops. Um, you know, Bill O'Neill came up with that. It's just kind of he pulled it uh, out of his um, whatever. But, you know, Delivermore, you say use 10%. Well, why? And that's because that's the most he wanted to lose. And then so I used to ask Bill about, you know, well, why 78%? Well, we studied, you know, 10 stocks and determined that that was the right legs. One of his failings, I thought, and I don't mean to, to, uh, to you know, downgrade Bill's genius because he wasn't a trading genius, but he, he picked things up intuitively and he was trying to relate it to other people and teach other people. And that's a difficult thing to do. Yeah. It's one thing to be able to make a lot of money in the market for yourself. It's a completely different thing to teach others uh, to do it. But, you know, he, he would use 20 sample, his sample size for any study would be 20 stocks, 50 stocks, you know, and I think you have to have at least a hundred in most cases. So I kind of replaced that with using moving averages, price levels, uh, whatever I can find as a reference point on the chart for a tight selling guide because I want to keep things tighter than 70%. And the reason for that is in this market, things are pretty volatile. And I'm sure you've noticed that. If you've been trading this market, just like this morning, things look like they're going to roll up, roll over and blow up. Uh, and they didn't. They found their feet. They turn around. We go higher. Uh, so, you know, it's just very volatile on an intraday basis. So you really have to keep your risk tight if you're going to play. And also you need to keep your entries tight and be willing to stop yourself out quickly to avoid disaster with the idea that you can quickly and easily re-enter the trade. So that's the one thing that the stock market gives you is ultimate liquidity. You can, you can sell what you bought earlier today. You can sell what you bought 25 seconds ago, you know. It's not like artwork. Um, in any case, I think that's basically how you have to approach the market right now. But you can even see MasterCard. I mean, look at this pattern. Up, down, up, down. Uh, you know, it's schizoid. And But you can tell, you can see here, and this is why I talk about taking scalps, you you can short these breaks of the 200-day line. This one's a lot cleaner than, say, this one. 
And then when it undercuts this low down here, that's your cover point. And you get a nice move out of three, four, five days. And you don't even need to, to get the whole thing. If you scalp, you know, from here down to here, you can be very happy with that. 10% move in two or three days, you know. So that's also what I refer to as, you know, doing one or two day scalps. Um, I'm not sure what the two-step thing someone was talking about is. Uh, maybe that's the two-step undercut and rally um, where a stock will take, you know, one or two attempts to uh, pull off an undercut and rally. It's like we saw that in GLD. Maybe that's what they were referring to. Um, so you can see if we take those lows down below, it actually undercut, it rallied back through those lows that I showed earlier here and then dropped back below and then regained it yesterday. So that was a two-step undercut and rally. And uh, I think with gold and silver, I'm, I'm more inclined to take a positional approach here unless I'm stopped out because this gives a chance uh, for this uh, wild card theory of mine to work out. And if it fails, it fails. But I think, you know, if, if uh, it is true and the Fed is going to start lowering rates because we're headed into a very nasty recession, then I think gold and silver, it may be their time to, uh, well, shine, I guess. Um, no pun intended. So anyways, so that's basically it. I could probably go on all afternoon. Meet me at the local bar and uh, we'll cross <laughs> some martinis and talk market. How about that? Uh, <laughs> I want to show a couple things. Uh, sure. You want, want me to turn the screen over to you? Yeah, Ron? please do. Uh, All right. Here uh, I go. Uh, let's see. How, okay. Let me share a screen here. I need to clean my screen up here. Okay. Uh, by the way, uh, for those HGSI users, uh, I put a, uh, and I'll, I haven't sent it to Gil yet even because I changed a few things, but uh, there is a new add-on uh, for Gil. The basic stuff is all there, but I've added some uh, user smart groups, and this is a part of the program that Gil doesn't use because he doesn't need to, is why he uh, doesn't use it. And I just want to cover a few things here. Uh, we're getting... Uh, a little longer on this uh, webinar than uh, we wanted to, but that's all right. Uh, anyway, let me quickly go through these, and then if you have uh, a few questions, I'll answer them. But I really think if you're, uh, you've got so many questions about the program itself and what things mean, I'm, uh, I'm willing to do a, a session uh, where I could just explain those things to you about the program itself. So if there's interest, just let let me know, and uh, I'll put that together. Anyway, how what did the market do today? Uh, I rebuilt these indexes, and uh, uh, this is one that I call in, in intraday market indicators. And you can just run this during the day, and you can see exactly what the market's doing. And uh, I'm going to just click on this and show you that these are all of the major stocks combined into a folder. And, and how many of these stocks? There's 2574. 1780 were up and 760 were down. So what's that? Two and a half to one. You can do this on any of the indexes. I'm I'm just going to do one more. The Nasdaq 100. There were 82 up and 18 down. And then if you rebuild these during the day and you want to go take a look at some of these stocks, you can just click in this window and go into the warehouse view. If you sort on raw combo, it's going to, I want to bring a different view up here. I'm getting lost. I should have done this before. Okay, here's what I'm looking for. You can just uh, bring it in here. This is the intraday view and this combo ranking I call it effort versus result, and it's it takes the price and the volume, and it drives the best stocks to the top of the list. So you can uh, come in here and just see what these stocks are doing. Okay, that's one thing you can do with this breadth, and I use that quite a bit. These are stocks and groups moving up and down intraday. I'm going to click on this first one. These are up and these are down. This cuts it off at 100 stocks. If I transfer this to the warehouse view, 
I can click on the spectrum analyzer and I can see which stocks are moving up. Now these 100 stocks are driven to this group by the combo ranking, which is driving stocks that have a large price movement and a strong range. This is the intraday range into this list. So you, once again, you get a quick read on where the strength is. This is interesting that REITs, uh, there's nine REITs in here, six auto parts, five restaurants, application software, and so on. But these smart groups give us a quick way to read what's going on both up and down in the market. Now, a couple things I've come up with recently, and this is in the new ad, add-on. HGS box stocks leaders. Now, if you want to know what a box stock is, uh, what you do is you go to your help menu, table of contents, it'll bring a browser up, HGS boxes. And this is searching. And just go to HGS boxes. And this is something Ian and his group that used to meet at the Palos Verdes Library came up with years ago. And these are fundamentally strong stocks or stocks whose earnings gr gr earnings growth is increasing. And we have box stocks 1 through 10. So if the annual earnings growth for five years is greater than 50% and the average of the earnings growth over the most recent two quarters is greater than 100, it's a box 1 stock and so on. I'm not going to read this to you. All that in information is in here. But what it's doing, it's limiting the stocks to the box stocks. So if you're interested in only stocks that are showing some earnings growth, there's SIGA at the top again, but let's look at Quanta Services. And you can see that this came up today as a stock that was moving up, and it was moving up here, and then it gapped up today. If I open up the fundamental windows window, you can see that there is strong earnings and revenue growth here. So this is the ki type of stock that the smart group is picking up. So yesterday it picked this up. These are leaders. Now, here's $75 or less. These are stocks that have pulled back the three below the six. And on the intraday, if it's green over here, you can tell they pulled back, but they're moving again. So here's Murphy Oil. Here is the pullback, and here's the move up. And once again, look at, look at the numbers up here on the earnings growth. These are stocks that have decent earnings growth. That's a counter trend. There's a pullback near the 50. There's not very many of these. And here's Auto Nation, which pulled back to the 50, and it was up today. So these user smart groups can be very powerful. Now here's one of my recent ones which I think has tremendous value and if you use one stock for low risk entries or one smart group for low risk entries uh, use one of these. This is, this is box stocks only. This is all stocks and what this does is it brings VPA into play with low volume tests or stocks that are seeing strength coming back in after moving down. So here was the low volume test on this stock today, ArchBest, and it took, or yesterday, the signal was generated yesterday, and it took off today. Let's just look at a few of these. Okay, here's your low volume test. Here's confirmation. It's extended. A flag is formed on here. So, you know, it could go higher. We have an effort to rise. Here is a low volume test. Here's a confirmation of this test. So the sole purpose of these screens is to find low risk entries. Here's your test. Here's the move up today. And the tests are generated the day before. And then by coming into the intraday scorecard, you can see which ones are moving. And if you catch them early, you can jump, jump on these. I, I like this screen. Uh, very much. Uh, so if you download the new version,
for HDSI users and to find that I'm going to show you this quickly because it's a little bit confusing anymore. If you go into the main menu and go to the add-ons page you can go down to Gil Morales and just click on this zip file and they've uh, really tightened the security up on these browsers so you're going to get a message here can't be downloaded because it's a zip file. Just click on this and select keep and then keep anyway and it'll let you download the new file. Okay, so these uh, these are some smart groups. There's a ton of things I could show you. We just don't have time. And uh, any questions on on that? Okay, where where can I find sample U and R setups? You can find the U and R setups. Let me get to all securities. I've got them in Gill's files. Now Gill may not look at the UNRs exactly like I do, but I, I did the best I could here and I think it's pretty valid. If you go into his views under undercut and rally, these are stocks that have pulled back the three below the six. And if you look at these two columns right here, this is the days since the three crossed down below the six. So you can tell how fresh or how old these signals are. Now this is the end of day and here's the intraday. So once again you look at the end of day and if you want to see which ones, are, which ones are moving up the following day you go to the intraday and it shows me there's Murphy again. Here's Sierra Wireless. It's It crossed over, crossed down four days ago. Zero is a crossover day. So I know that this crossed down four days ago, but now it's moving up today. So let's look at Sierra Wireless. Here's the it hasn't crossed over yet, but see this blue line, these blue lines in here, the light ones, those mean that the stock is under accumulation. Okay. Uh, these these um, you know you just Gill has been doing this for so long. He can just look at these charts and decide all this himself. I built this for people that do not have a lot of training experience that want to look for these types of stock. Let's look at this one right here. The signal is 11 days old and because the crossover happened back here, if you look down at this histogram here, that's where the crossover happened. Here's accumulation, gap down. We didn't get the crossover yet. But what do we have here? This is setting up. If I click on this, uh, let's let's do this. I don't have the VPA stuff up here, but I'm gonna I'll show you how to do this. Edit the indicator, VPA display VPA flags over here, and then I can go here for the newbie, and I can click on that, and it says strength seen returning after a downtrend effort to rise which is the cyan dot in this candle. So we have two signals. Here's a confirmation of that signal. If this crosses over tomorrow, and you don't have to wait for the crossover, but you're seeing the accumulation on these stocks. So once again, what, what I have here, these are the ones that are under, the three is below, or the six is below the three. These are the crossovers that are crossing over with a two-day window. Zero is a crossover day. One means it happened two days ago. So let's look at this one. Here's the crossover. Here's the confirmation of that crossover. And then look what happened with this stock today. Never heard of this stock, but uh, you can see that it was setting up here. These blue, light blue lines indicate accumulation. And then the dark blue indicates the crossover on the three and six. Hey Ron. Yes. I'm looking at this table that you have here. The, the days, is that that left side column of the days, is that days since the undercut and rally? The, no, the this is the days since the three crossed the six. If, if it's in okay. this column, 
it's a crossover day. And I gave this a two-day okay. window, Gil, so in case you miss it the okay. first day, you're going to pick it up the second. Right. I would hope to catch it on the zero. Okay. Well, so if we go back to this one, this is the one you want right here, the zero day or the, before it even crosses over. But right. then if you go to the next one, these are, I sorry, I clicked on the wrong one. These are the crossover days. Here's Funko. That crossed over yesterday. Uh huh. Because the zero represents yesterday, not today. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. So that's why I put these columns in here. Did the same thing for the volume point of control and <clears> the <throat> and the crossover days, the three and the six. And I think it uh, it works out pretty nicely. Look at all these accumulation days here. Then there's a crossover and a follow through today on this. Hey, Ron, look at the, the GLD chart Okay. using this. Oh. Yeah, that was showing some signs along the lows. Okay, here's an accumulation day, but there's also a uh, contrasting VPA flag, no demand, and then an effort to fall, and then following an effort to rise with accumulation, and then the crossover. And now you've got two pocket pivots, one through the 10 day, one through the 20. The, yes. No, th this is a, I use an 18. Okay. Okay. So, well, close enough. I yeah. Mean, you know, you know these okay. moving averages don't have to be exact. That's been my experience. <clears throat> no, they don't. And, and, you know, people have spent you know, quibble over that stuff. It's not worth it. They're too, you know, they're close. Anyway, the, somebody's got a question. Are these undercutting moving averages? These are only undercutting and uh, three and six day moving average, exponential moving averages. That's all it is on the triggers. And also, you actually can see a tiny little, what I would call a mini undercut and rally. So the low point would be, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven days ago, that would be your low. So that would be that right there, yeah. And then you can see that uh, seven days ago, so that would be one, two, three, four, four, four days later, you have that bigger red bar. See that? Yes, right here. So that, that actually undercuts that prior low from a week prior, right? Yes. And then the next day you get an undercut and rally. So that is kind of a mini undercut and rally. And at the same time, you're getting the little green box. And what does that mean, Ron? The green box right here, it, it, strength seen returning it's, after a downtrend. Yeah. And then this is an effort to rise. Yeah. yeah. Now you were, I was, I look at these, um, these charts uh, pretty much every day just to get a, a sense for when I'm seeing something that kind of jives with what I'm seeing on the, the standard uh, bar chart that I use. Okay, the, the moving, somebody's got a question here. Uh, the, uh, the moving averages, uh, the triggers are the three and the six, yes, but these other moving averages are uh, long term, 200, 150, and the 18. This puts it in context. I mean, this is this is still in a downtrend, but it's emerging, a potential merving, merging, not merging. Yeah, I like, um, I, I thought the, the way you combine using the three and the six uh, moving average, three and the six day exponential, right? Uh, yes. Moving averages. Yeah. yeah it, 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 a lot of times an undercut and rally won't work on the first one, but what I've noticed, they will tend to work better when the three crosses above the six and holds and then you're usually in business and you can see that happen more recently and that's why this is finally turned so if you start seeing a lot of uh <clears throat> vpa signals along the lows but you're not really getting that that clean cross uh of the three over the six that can usually be a cautionary sign that it may not work this one's working though so far. i totally agree with you gil i mean and look as the as the market is falling here, look how the three moves away from the six, and that's represented yeah. in this histogram down here. And then as they start getting closer together, as some of the selling pressure is coming off, notice the histogram, these bars are much less. So here's the three yeah. six, here's the six eighteen, and then the eighteen fifty. That's but I try to put everything in context 
And I know right. that I'm going against the tide here, but it's starting to work now. Right. Yeah, and this is a good example of how I can describe to you something I'm looking at and the way it sets up. And then I'm not quite sure how you uh, you do it, but you are able to find a way to quantify it, in this case with a 3 over 6 cross uh, and some other indicators in here that may give you a better signal. Um, usually the better signals I've noticed also are when you have a deeper blue color, a darker blue color bar occurring after a large number of lighter blue bars. Um, and I don't, I'm not really sure what well, that means, it means exactly. Well, it, it means the uh, accumulation period's been prolonged, and uh, it's starting to move. Not as strong on the way down. And then once you see a shift, in other words, it tilts the other way, then I think they tend to work better. Because you'll see a lot of blue bars on the left side of the chart. They don't go anywhere. And uh, the, the one that does try to go somewhere is the far, farthest to the left, and it goes a little further than the others, I think, uh, probably because you have a longer period of lighter blue bars. I, you know, I don't know if that's true. That's just something I've noticed going through these charts. Let's do this. Let's so. do this quickly. Uh, we're running long, but that's all right. I want to point this out. Uh, yeah, I thought we were going to keep it to 30 minutes. That was your idea. <laughs> I didn't want to cut you off because you were rolling. We're uh, having too much fun. What can I say? Uh, well, you know, I, we both enjoy doing these. Anyway, let's, let's look at... Uh, uh, Give me a stock that's moved uh, a ways. That's moved a ways? Well, here's a decent, uh -huh. well, this is just a one-day accumulation, but this is a really good example here of a low-volume test, an accumulation bar, which is a white candle, and a confirmation of that test on the same day that the three crosses the six. I mean, this is a short accumulation, but it's coming down to the 50-day moving average and finding support there. Yeah, this these setups will work on on anything. Uh, it can be an eat leverage ETF and so on. Of course, you know they they move a lot faster, obviously. Yeah. Uh, there's one more thing, Gil. I I don't think you're probably aware of this. Let me show you quickly. Uh, let's say you were talking about risk. See this little tool up here. Mm -hmm. Click on this R tool. If I want to know how much risk I'm taking, I don't want to take a 7% risk, but I will go down to this point and click on that. Now, I need to put these bars on here. And I can draw this out over here. And it tells me that my risk on this trade would be 3.52% if I put the stop at the bottom of this prior bar. Mm-hmm. Did you know? Yeah, I I definitely like rather uh, I prefer to run trades that tight. The, the whole seven eight percent business to me um, isn't really that optimal. Did you have you ever used that tool? I actually never have. Well, I I may have to, but I mean I can eyeball what my risk is right away. So, but most people can't. Um, no, and and I think that's what makes this useful for people who are relatively new. A lot of it is. Uh, you know, displayed for you, and after a while, maybe you just catch on on your own. So okay, here's a question: Do these U and R stocks have to be in an overall uptrend? You can have them in an uptrend where it says fan up, or you can have them where it says no fan up. I, I put them all in here, but you don't want them uh, in a fan down. I don't. Well, no fan up. Uh, let's just take. The fan can be up or not up. Uh, if you go over here to the right, and uh, EMA fan right here, this tells you if the fans are up or down. And every one of these are down, it looks like, because that's what I'm on here. No fan up. But if I go back to the fan up stocks and then scroll over here to the right, you can see that the EMA fans are all up because it says yes here. This works best if you're, in my opinion, it depends on the market. I shouldn't say this because, you know, uptrending stocks that pull back and set up again, uh, it works, it seems to work really well. 
any i prefer to uh i prefer to see undercut and rally moves occur along the lows of bases within uptrends uh, yeah yeah so, but an, yeah. but an uptrend we agree on that yeah I mean, I mean you can use them to pick off bottoms but a lot of times the daily chart uh may not be sufficient you may also be having to look at the the weekly chart when you start trying to pick off you know bottoms after protracted downtrends like like what we're seeing right now if you look at the weekly chart of gold and uh, silver gld and slv i also like the kilpatrick weekly chart that, that's a useful one as well yeah that that's uh right here yeah so um if you look at gld for example okay so we saw some constructive action on the uh, as it was turning off the lows, and that's on that daily chart. The uh, this is a weekly the BPA chart that you were showing. Now this is a weekly, okay? But what I want to what I want to point out here is this is how you would use. Can you compress that more so we get more data on the left Absolutely. side? Absolutely. Okay, there we go. Oh, there oh. we go. So yeah, there's the whole uh, consolidation since we had the big run up in 2020, and and it peaked when Warren Buffett said that he's finally wanted to buy gold and gold miners um, but in any case you have this undercut of these lows and and the positive action on the VPA chart the one with the blue bars and everything the daily chart the daily candle mm -hmm. um, you you would view that within the context of what you're seeing on the weekly chart with respect to undercutting and rallying back above the two lows from the middle of 2021 Ron so I believe that would be the uh, right here, the August. No, the August twenty-one low. So it's just past. It's I guess seven twenty-one or eight twenty-one. Keep going to the right. To the right. You're in twenty. To the right. You're yeah, a little more right there. Eight twenty-one. That's the first low, and there's the second low. Right. Is uh, two months later. That would have been what, ten early early October. So those are the lows that we just undercut and rallied back above. So well, my point is, is that <clears throat> another way to, to figure out whether signals on that VPA chart are going to have more validity, because there are a lot of, of signals there, a lot of VPA symbols there, uh, and the blue bars as well. But you also have to, I think, look at that within the context of what is going on in the weekly chart when you are trying to pick off what could be a major low. So it's a little trickier. So that's why this last low and turn in gold off the lows on an undercut and rally move, uh, I think may have more legs. You're also pretty well extended to the downside. So, and it is also another piece of the puzzle in my wildcard theory. Okay. Well, there's a weekly and daily combined. I see what you're talking about here. Yeah. And so you, you use one to kind of put things in perspective and maybe add some additional uh, evidence to uh, confirm what you're looking at on one or the other. So on the daily, you're seeing that turn. You're seeing the big blue bar after a series of lighter blue bars. You're seeing all the VPA signals. And then if you reference that against the weekly chart, then you can see um, that we're also in position where you have a longer-term undercut and rally, so extending back to last year. So, And a lot of times when I'm looking for lows with undercut and rally moves, okay, I'm looking at longer-term lows versus uh, on the way up, I like to look for undercut and rallies in a base that's part of an overall uptrend because that's usually where your continuation moves right. will come out of. Yeah, yeah. And that that's essentially a Wyckoff spring, you know, that's what Wyckoff spring was. Yeah, you're But uh, you can also get it on weekly charts on a longer term basis. So You're looking for contraction. That's, that's my point. You're looking for contraction. Yeah. And then hope, hoping for expansion. Yeah. Yes. Okay, uh I was going to say one more thing and uh I forgot <laughs> What I was going to say. Uh, oh, I know. Uh oh, I a, know. You're having a Biden moment. Here, let, let me show you this. Uh, this is what I mentioned. Uh, the box stocks, uh, fundamentally, or stocks with earnings growth. You don't have to screen on all securities. If I just want to concentrate on box stocks, I'm go we'll go to consistent earnings growth right here and see if just use that as my my base right there and these are stocks that have consistent earnings growth and they are undercutting what is this this is the rally okay let me let me get that other chart back up here so
So if you want to concentrate just on these stocks, uh, this uh, these box stocks, the consistent earnings growth, these are recalculated every day when the earnings come out and so on. Earnings don't come out uh, every day. Well, let me just say this information is fresh information every day because the uh, when you're doing that updating process and it says updating fundamentals, all of this stuff is being calculated. So I know all of this information is current about these box stocks. But if you want to concentrate on these only, um, you can. And you can see that, uh, well, there's Funko. Dicom was up 1.87% today. Uh, earnings due not till September. And this, this was a two-day window. Here's your first day, here's your second, and then a follow-through today. Okay, I suppose we should shut this off. It's an hour and a half, Gil. Let's just go, Let's just go all night. Uh, I've got people coming over. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. Um, yeah, I mean, the market is a complex piece. You, you get me going on it, I can go for a long time. So, well, But that's because I can see so much. Uh, Thanks to HGSI. For, for those of you who are not experienced, and none of us are as experienced as Gil is. Well, I shouldn't say that. I started messing with this. Uh, you've, been, uh, you've been around a long time, I've been time, around Ron. a long time. <laughs> no, no, Ron's too modest. He's way too modest. I think uh, he's a genius at putting this stuff together, and I'm always in awe when he starts going through it. Um, and I have to try and keep my uh, eyes from rolling into the back of my head. I'm, I'm so overwhelmed often. <laughs> well, thanks, Gil. But all I know is you've created some great stuff, and uh, I like it, and it works for me. And, uh, again, like I said, I, I only delved, you know, I barely touched the surface of this, of this uh, program, and it works for me. So don't be intimidated by it. Just to figure out that, you know, all you need to do is – conquer a small bit of HGSI territory you make the software work for you and then you can expand your empire as it goes on I'm trying to put it into one of those video game things that people play but you know you can take it from there and that's kind of what I've been doing steadily and slowly I add little things that uh, I either learn from Ron or I pick up from playing around with the system so and it's fun and, so, and one thing I don't know you know if it's if it isn't fun don't, why do it I, I agree <laughs> And I, I can yeah. honestly say after 20 years or, or slightly more of working with this program that I discover new stuff about once a week. Now, think about that. I've been doing this yeah. for 20-some years, and uh, yeah. I think of new ways to to get the most out of the program. And these are some ideas right here. You know, box stocks, scan for these intraday. And... Uh, uh, there's going to be an email coming out uh, with a link and uh, uh, to uh, try HGSI for everybody who registered. So I, I'm not going to talk about that today, Paul. We can save it for another time, Ron. Okay. There's one more question. On the UNR, do you buy intraday when it crosses over or do we uh, – yeah, it's probably the simplest uh, setup there is. You know, you identify the prior low in the pattern. And uh, if it undercuts, I mean, the undercut and rally started out as a short covering point. If you go and read Short Selling with the O'Neill Disciples, I talk about how if I short a stock up at moving average resistance and it breaks down to the lows of a pattern and undercuts those lows and rallies back up through them, that'll be my cover point. In the, in the QE market, I discovered that that was also a uh, a long entry point. So, yeah, but those are basic. And, and usually by the time you get an undercut, right? Well, like look at the V chart. We looked at that. You know, you're getting good 10, 15% moves on the downside. And even Bill O'Neill said, you know, on the short side, because it's so much more volatile, you want to be taking profits often. And using the undercut and rally as a cover point was a great way to figure out where to take profits and get that 10, 15, 20% that you've made. And then in the QE market, flip back to the long side. So then the UNR has become a long entry signal um, in a QE bull market. Right now we're in a bear market, so they don't have as high of a success rate. Right. Okay, uh, another question. I'm sorry, right. Gil. Is there a video to learn how to use software? I've got all kinds of videos. Uh, an email will come out, and if you 
If you take the trial, uh, there will be links to videos on how to get started. And uh, even some of those are a little bit dated even because I'm always improving uh, the program. But they will get you started. And I'll do more sessions like this uh, to show people how to get the most out of the program. I'd be happy to do that. Okay, Gills Fires and Files, I, right. I, uh, uh, when you install the program, the files will be there. I sent uh, George, a link to George today for the new add-on, so Gills Files will be there. By the way, this is a really great signal here. This is why I set up that scan for intraday. If you get the low-volume test and the follow-through, and it's crossing through, the three and the six, that is an excellent signal. Okay, let's shut her down. Anybody else? I better not take any more questions. This could go on forever. Okay, okay. sounds good, Bill, Ron. thank you very everybody. much for doing yeah. this. My pleasure, absolutely. Okay. Take care. Thank you.